Thank you, everybody, for coming this evening and uh, observing all the COVID regulations that are so important for our safety. And uh, I'm very grateful to the Traditional Britain Group for inviting me to speak, uh, as well as to all of you for attending. I first attended uh, the conferences and dinners eight years ago, and um, it's a real honor to see my name uh, added to a list of much more prominent thinkers, such as uh, uh, Sir Roger Scruton, who I rather admire. Uh, it was almost seven years ago that uh, the late Sir Roger Scruton addressed this group, and he told us that the focus of our identity ought to be Englishness rather than Britishness. And uh, he suggested, as he had in his book, England and Elegy, that the unique and defining aspects of the Anglo-Saxon nations were their institutions and laws. It is on these, he argued, we need to rely, and these we need to revive if we are to preserve our identity. After the talk, I asked him how we, as a people, can tie our national identity to institutions that have been turned against us. The England of civilised clubs and private societies, cricket on the village green, tea and biscuits after Sunday mass, all very lovely, but it is not likely to exist for our children. And we, should be, we would be quite wise to raise them with a healthy suspicion of the authorities and associated institutions, given the current ideological trajectory of Britain and the West in general. Did everybody hear me OK? The, yeah. yes. the back. Good, good. Very audible. Thank you. Uh, the church, uh, universities, government, charities, NGOs, that's a funny name, non-profits, all of these have been... Uh, infiltrated by left-wing extremists, often with an open uh, racial hatred of white people and their cultures. So is that the end of Englishness? Scruton might have concluded that it is, but I disagree. I do agree with him, though, that Englishness itself has been an evolving construct. That's what he said to the traditional Britain group. Uh, and it's been adapting to meet the challenges of the times. He typified the English as a gentle, moderate, and peaceful people. Yet, this is only true for part of our history. We have also been barbarians. And it is, it is as barbarians that we were first known as a nation. Therefore, this evening, I will describe some of the ways that the legacy of our Anglo-Saxon forebears has been employed in the construction of Englishness over the centuries. And I hope you won't find it too boring if you're not into history, but I assume since you came here to hear me, you're not. But, uh, well, England begins, forgive me if you already know, but with the Anglo-Saxon invasions of the 5th century. A combination of new genetic evidence, old archaeological evidence, or relatively old, not as old as historical evidence, of course, and a novel approach to the analysis of skull morphology, or uh, craniometry, have all revealed what really happened in this obscure period of history to which we trace our ethnogenesis. Well, it should be sufficient for me to say that, but I know that some people want to know specifically the papers, and for those nerdy people, I'll just say that the, the, the genetics I'm referring to, uh, the paper Schiffels et al. Uh, 2016, and the basic cranial uh, shape-based assessment of local and continental Northwest European ancestry among 5th to 9th century um, Anglo-Saxons by Plomp and colleagues is the, uh, the skull uh, paper, which is relevant. So what they show, large numbers of Germanic peoples from the continent migrated in a seemingly coordinated way. They were genetically like modern Scandinavians and contribute approximately 40% to the overall genetic makeup of the modern English ethnic group. However, their initial impact on eastern England was far higher. And this is possibly as much as 80%. According to a paper that will be coming out very soon, it's already been submitted to a journal, I expect it will be out early next year. It will be titled The Anglo-Saxon Migration and Formation of the Early English Gene Pool by Gretzinger and colleagues at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History. So 80% is a massive replacement. The Skull study I've already mentioned found approximately 75% replacement. So they're roughly in agreement with each other. What followed this initial invasion was a period of integration, whereby the formerly Brythonic-speaking natives either adopted a Germanic language and culture, or they fled to the western fringes of the island where they became the Cornish and the Welsh. 
the result is that while we are now only about 40% like the early Anglo-Saxons, we are about 100% the same as the middle and late Anglo-Saxons who had already assimilated the native population. The modern English ethnic group existed in the middle Anglo-Saxon era, and by the time the term Anglo-Saxon itself was in use, the people who it referred to were the same as us. That's really important to remember when people are playing word games with this area of history. The first attempt to construct a coherent, unifying identity for Germanic-speaking peoples of these islands was made by the Venerable Bede, or Bede, if it would have been pronounced, in his Historia Ecclesiastica Gentis Anglorum, completed in about 731. He uses the Latin term Anglorum, which comes from Angles, uh, to refer to one of, the Germanic, it's one of the Germanic tribes that migrated, and he uses it to refer to all of them. Uh, and it translates as English people, just as we use the same word now, English, to refer to all of us, uh, regardless if it's Angle or Saxon, whatever. The term, hyphenated term Anglo-Saxon emerged a bit later when King Alfred the Great, formerly just King of the West Saxons, captured the Mercian Anglian territory of London in 886. So he was then known as Rex Anglo-Saxonum. That's a Latinization of Anglo-Saxon. By this time, the idea of England was at least 155 years old, yet our unified nation-state did not exist. However, both the terms English, or Anglorum, and Anglo-Saxon were in use to describe the Germanic-speaking people of Britain. The title, Rex, Anglo, Rex Anglo-Saxonum, was used again for Alfred's successor, Edward, but Alfred's grandson, Avelston, sometimes seen as the first king of all England, was called Rex Anglorum, a title which implied rulership of all England, while the previous title of Rex Anglo-Saxonum was used in a more restrictive sense, surprisingly, to imply rulership of some Saxon and Anglian territories, which is possibly why it was later applied to Adelstan's successor, Edmund, after the Vikings had captured Northumbria, so that Edmund was not truly the ruler of all the Anglorum. It seems the term Anglorum, or English, included the Northumbrians, while the term Anglo-Saxon excluded Northumbrians for some reason I don't fully understand, but it's got something to do with Vikings. So later in the 11th century, the Normans took over and brought an end to the so-called Anglo-Saxon era. Uh, they didn't call it that at the time, of course. But it didn't bring an end to Englishness. Our neighbours on the continent referred to us then, and still do, with names derived from those Germanic tribes. Angle becomes Anglais. And while our Celtic-speaking neighbours refer to us with names like Sassanach, from Saxon. Yet, for a few centuries, Englishness was marginalised in its homeland, with the church using Latin and the court speaking Anglo-Norman French. But the Normans called the native people Anglais, and in so doing, recognised their distinct ethnic identity. The earliest extant Anglo-Norman French dialect literature appears under the reign of Henry I in the early 12th century, and during this time, English literature takes a back seat. Apart from a few religious texts and the Peterborough Chronicle, we have little in early Middle English literature from uh, Middle English from the 12th century. But there's a bit. Henry of Huntingdon's Historia Anglorum was published around 1129, and it relied on Anglo-Saxon texts to tell a history of England. And in it, Henry coined the phrase Anglia Plena Jokis. Uh, my Latin is not very good, but uh, I think it means England full of jokes. And possibly that's the origin of the idea of merry old England, a nostalgia for an England which has been lost, something perhaps some of us are familiar with. Uh, in 1215, a history of Britain was written called Leoman's Brut, which, while including a number of Norman words, also deliberately employs archaic Anglo-Saxon vocabulary. This is hundreds of years after the Norman Conquest, perhaps as an assertion of pre-Norman identity. Yet the text itself relies more on the garbled fake history of the Welshman, Geoffrey of Monmouth, who, inverted the myth, uh, who invented the myth of a Trojan origin of the British race. Indeed, we see that the English author seems more invested in the Brythonic figure of Arthur than in Anglo-Saxon heroes like Beowulf. Arthur was a celebrated literary figure of the Middle Ages, 
more, palata more palatable to the French-speaking aristocracy than were any of the Teutonic heroes of the Anglo-Saxons. The Normans approved of and benefited from a mythic national narrative in which the Britons were the original people of England, thereby justifying the subjugation of the English people. By the time Middle English literature really takes off, it's as though the entire nation is suffering from amnesia. Chaucer's famous writings occasionally invoke pre-Norman English figures, such as the Germanic water god, Wade, who is mentioned in the Merchant's Tale of the Canterbury Tales. An anonymously authored poem from the late 14th century titled Athelstan is set in Anglo-Saxon England, and it seems to be about King Athelstan, uh, the first king of the Anglorum, who I mentioned. Yet this Athelstan is no celebrated leader, but a tyrant who is contrasted with uh, his successor, St Edmund, who is portrayed more favourably. Thomas Mallory's 15th century Le Mort d'Arthur translates many popular French stories of King Arthur into Middle English, thus cementing the Frenchified Celtic hero in the English national identity and making him a folk hero of the very race he was originally supposed to be an enemy of, the English. Yet the land in which Arthur and his knights' adventures take place is called England in those stories. So, it seems that during the High and Late Middle Ages, the Anglo-Saxon part of Englishness went underground. Scarcely mentioned in literature, but surely present in unrecorded forms among the peasants who vaguely remembered a time before the Normans, before forests and common lands were closed off to them and made the exclusive property of the nobility. The word Anglo-Saxon reappears along with a renewed interest in the early English past in the mid-16th century, motivated by an awakening Protestant national consciousness, seeking to define itself in opposition to the Catholic South. For the last 500 years, this Protestant identity has repeatedly relied on the Anglo-Saxon origin, on our Anglo-Saxon origin, to justify various political positions. Liberals, reformers, and Americans have all attempted to construct an historical narrative which connects the diggers of the 17th century back to Watt Tyler and the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, and even further back to an idealized Anglo-Saxon past, in which it is alleged rulers afforded more rights to the native peasant than the later Norman rulers did. One of the 17th century extremist leaders of the diggers, Gerard Winstanley, wrote, Oh, what mighty delusion do you, who are the powers of England, live in, that while you pretend to throw down that Norman yoke and Babylonish power, and have promised to make the groaning people of England a free people, yet you still lift up that Norman yoke and slavish tyranny, and hold the people as much in bondage as the bastard conqueror himself and his council of war. A chasm of about 19 generations separated the diggers from the Anglo-Saxons at this time, yet when Stanley was confident that this invocation of the Norman conquest and the idea that the English had been and should be once more a free people would be understood and well received by his audience. And that's worth considering when we are told that the Anglo-Saxons were not relevant after the conquest. 100 years after that, Anglo-Saxonist founding father of America, Thomas Jefferson, believed a focus on this heritage could consolidate a new identity which simultaneously continued one kind of constructed Englishness while distinguishing itself from that of the British Empire, which it opposed. In this view, the Anglo-Saxons are a race with a natural predilection for democracy, one which the motherland presumably abandoned due to alleged Norman and perhaps Catholic influence. In 1776, a committee was formed to create a seal for the new United States of America. Jefferson argued that it should include, I quote, Hengist and Horsa, the Saxon chiefs from whom we claim the honor of being descended, and whose political principles and form of government we have assumed. The seal was rejected. <laughs> Modern Marxists also pick and choose parts of this historical narrative in a similar way, claiming the diggers as an early socialist movement, although it was really a handful of Protestant extremists, just 52 in Surrey, uh, who failed to achieve their ends and lasted barely two years. Hardly a national, national tradition, is it? There's more people in this room now. Common law and demands for the land rights of peasants were central to the romantic re-emergence of the Anglo-Saxon component of Englishness. In reality, though, common law dates to the Norman period, and it's not clear to what extent it was actually derived from earlier Anglo-Saxon legal traditions. 
So we can see that the early modern revival of Anglo-Saxon identity was very much driven by radical liberal beliefs, which sought historical justification in an alleged golden age of Anglo-Saxon liberty. And this trend continued. In the 1730s, the Whig politician Richard Temple, first Viscount Cobham, commissioned the Dutch sculptor John Michael Rusbrack to create statues of the Anglo-Saxon gods, complete with runic inscriptions to be displayed in his gardens at Stowe. The statues were part of a group of buildings and statuary commissioned by Lord Cobham, which were intended to embody a political program championing Whig beliefs in historic British liberty. The statue of Thunor the Thunder God is now in the VNA. I went to see it this morning before I came here. In 1840, Queen Victoria married her cousin, Prince Albert of Saxe Coburg and Gotha, and the British public began to celebrate their Anglo Saxon heritage with renewed vigour. They realised that the very origins of English monarchy were rooted in our Germanic past, when pagan kings claimed descent from the great god Woden. Her Majesty the Queen claims descent from Alfred the Great, who in turn claimed descent from Woden himself. You can also see a marble statue by William Feed of Queen Victoria and Albert dressed as Anglo-Saxons, or at least how the Victorians thought Anglo-Saxons might have dressed, in the Royal Mausoleum, or there's also a plaster copy in the National Portrait Gallery. Their daughter, the Princess Royal, had the idea for the statue after Albert died. At the unveiling of the statue of King Alfred the Great in Winchester in 1901, then Prime Minister Rosebery said... In him, we venerate the ideal Englishman, the perfect sovereign, the pioneer of England's greatness. And the Victorian novelist and historian Sir Walter Besant described King Alfred as the typical man of our race. Call him Anglo-Saxon, call him American, call him Australian, the typical man of our race at his best and noblest. But Anglo-Saxon heritage fell out of fashion again, along with all things Germanic, as tensions between Germany and Britain escalated in the run-up to the First World War, with the result that the royal family changed their name to Windsor to conceal their German origin. World War II made anti-German sentiment even stronger, and post-war attitudes to history and archaeology saw an ideological shift, which led to many earlier narratives of historic invasions and racial replacements being brought into question. Anglo-Saxons were not fashionable anymore, with some exceptions, such as the great works of the deeply conservative author and Anglo-Saxon philologist J.R.R. Tolkien, who was heavily influenced by Norse and Anglo-Saxon poetry and sagas. But besides him, there's not a great deal. But by the early 21st century, people like the archaeologist Francis Pryor, an Englishman with a special love of all things Celtic, attempted to argue that the Anglo-Saxon invasion was in reality a small-scale migration with very limited impact on the island. <laughs> this he claimed on the basis that archaeological evidence is lacking, even though we actually do see a significant shift to Germanic-style burials and grave goods at precisely the same time we would expect in the east of the country. Genetic evidence at that time, which was 2005, was not very good, to be fair, um, so it could not be rely, relied upon to prove or disprove an Anglo-Saxon migration. Yet Pryor's theory of limited migration failed to explain how Germanic language, Old English, completely replaced Brythonic language as the, of this land. Um, but thankfully, genetic science has marked the end of the era of Anglo-Saxon deniers, or maybe not, but as you'll see... The so-called genomic revolution of the last 10 years refers to significant breakthroughs in the science of genetics, including archaeogenetics, which, rely, which requires retrieval of valid DNA samples from ancient skeletons. As a result, the so-called dark ages are not quite as dark, and we can se sequence entire genomes of Anglo-Saxon skeletons and compare them to thousands of modern English DNA samples, thanks to people like Sir Walter Bodmer, who recently spoke to the traditional Britain group about this is a landmark genetic study of the people of the British Isles. Uh, to briefly summarise what the DNA has shown, we're certain that an Anglo-Saxon invasion did occur, 
and that we do descend from those invaders, but we also descend from the previous inhabitants, uh, not the Romans, but the, uh, the people who were there before the Romans. Uh, but in reality, the genetic difference between the Brythonic people and the Anglo-Saxons is not significant uh, in a, in a Europe-wide context. Uh, they're quite closely related, and they all descend from the same Indo-European peoples who inhabited Northwest Europe 4,000 years ago. Despite this wealth of new evidence, there are still a few persistent denialists. Recently, Chris Catling and Susan Oosthuizen have tried to downplay the significance of the Germanic influence on post-Roman Britain. They rely on quite flimsy arguments, like saying the Germanic-style brooches and jewellery were manufactured by natives who were just copying imported Germanic works. And that might be true, but it ignores the fact that the natives were genetically mixed with Germanic invaders, and they spoke a Germanic language. So they were Germanic people. Um, they also point to the now well-documented well evidence of very diverse Roman soldiers stationed in Britain during the Roman occupation. Anyone who's ever seen BBC will probably know all about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and they imply that any of those cultures could just as well have been significantly influential on early English culture as the Anglo-Saxons. But that argument it, it falls completely flat. There were certainly were exotic members of the uh, Roman army stationed in Britain from North Africa and from the Middle East, etc. But we don't speak their language. We didn't adopt any of their language. Their material culture is not evident in any of the Anglo-Saxon material culture. It's clearly in sync with the rest of Germanic Europe. And then, of course, we have the genetics, which show we don't have any DNA from these allegedly vast amounts of Middle Easterners who uh, they imagine were living here. So a 2016 study by Martiniano and colleagues called The Genomic Signals of Migration and Continuity in Britain Before the Anglo-Saxons shows that the Britons were the same genetically after Roman occupation as they had been before. So in other words, the diverse Roman soldiers all left Britain uh, with the Romans, as you can imagine. The genetic impact of the Anglo-Saxons, on the other hand, was much more significant. Besides these persistent deniers, genetic science has convinced everyone that the invasion did occur and that we, the English, are indeed the kin of the Anglo-Saxons. But in the last two years, the woke crowd of race baiters and anti-white activists have scheduled the term Anglo-Saxon itself for demolition. Medieval history, or medievalism, has been infiltrated, like all the humanities in Western academia, by Marxists and many peculiar neo-Marxists and other left left-wing extremist ideologues, the sort of people who list their pronouns on social media. <laughs> there are very few key figures in woke medievalism, but they have been given loud and prominent platforms by the legacy media. An Asian woman called Dorothy Kim, radicalized in Californian universities, calls herself a historian, but made a career out of attacking historians and calling them all white, his white supremacists. She was once limited to annoying people on Facebook groups, but then major platforms like Time and the New York Times gave her some attention. After Kim came an anti-British woman of mixed ancestry named Mary Ramburan Olm, who, in her online persona, calls herself Axel Folio PhD, hates white noise. Her entire career consists of complaining about white people, for whom she harbors a clearly pathological hatred. Olm led the charge in 2019 of a far-left attempt to banish the word Anglo-Saxon from academic discourse on the grounds that it is allegedly racist and also that Anglo-Saxon studies are too white. In fact, <laughs> in fact according to Olm and Kim, medievalism itself is rooted in white supremacy. Her whinging blogs resulted in the International Society of Anglo-Saxonists holding a vote on whether to change their name. She resigned from her position as second vice president of that society, which apparently, despite being racist, allowed her to be the vice president. Uh, anyway, the stunt had the desired effect, and they renamed themselves the International Society for the Study of Early Medieval England. One Durand, trying to convince the University of Cambridge to drop the term, wrote in February 2020 that 
Historically, the people of early medieval England did not generally refer to themselves as Anglo-Saxon, abandoning the term after a period of infrequent use during the 8th and 9th centuries. Self-identification as English or Anglican was the norm. He was there echoing the tweets of a notorious far-left activist and self-described queer medievalist and helicopter parent to a kitty. That would have gone down well in those times. <laughs> By the name of Eric Wade, a fanboy of Olm and Kim, who wrote in September of the previous year, the term Anglo-Saxon is not the primarily self-ID sick of the group we traditionally call the Anglo-Saxons. Alfred and a few others use it somewhat in the 8th and 9th century. Then it largely dies out. This is misleading, though. A 10th century charter of King Eardwig describes him as king of the Anglosu, which is an abbreviation of Anglo-Saxonum, which is Latin for Anglo-Saxon. And even King Knut, the Viking king who became our <laughs> king of England, sometimes used the title king of the Anglo-Saxons, as recently as the 11th century. So these so-called historians, really Marxist activists, uh, either don't know what they're talking about or they're just lying. Uh, each is quite plausible. I'll leave it to you to decide. So for some reason, even the Smithsonian links to Wade's Twitter rants as though they were a reliable source. This is the same person who tweeted, without any evidence, the libelous accusation that I was somehow linked to a terrorist organization, something he evidently claimed simply because I disagree with his ridiculous cancel culture narratives, couched in neo-Marxist buzzwords, and anti-white dog whistles like whiteness, a word which is clearly intended to dehumanize white people and therefore legitimize and even encourage violence against them. In any case, as many have pointed out, even if Anglo-Saxon has been used in racist contexts, so has the word English. And as for Angelkun, that literally translates as race of the Angles, or it could be used to mean the English, so the English race or Anglo-Saxon race. And somehow I don't think the woke lovies would be any happier with that. Even the lefty TV historian Michael Wood admitted in his response to the controversy that on the continent in the 8th century, Paul the Deacon speaks of the Anglo-Saxonus, Alfred and his successors used King of the Anglo-Saxons as a title for their new order. We may drop Anglo-Saxonists then. We may prefer early English, but we cannot dispense entirely with Anglo-Saxons. It is somewhat ironic, actually, that the left have attacked this term because Anglo-Saxon identity is historically a force of the left, in my opinion. It is integrated with a narrative of class conflict reinforced by the media. The Guardian published articles blaming Normans for current inequality in 2011, 2012, and 2019. In reality, though, <laughs> the 2021 Rich List includes no Norman surnames in the top ten. It does have two Anglo-Saxon names, Weston and Dyson. The rest are Indian, Russian, and Jewish, but not Norman. The fiction is also depicted in TV dramas. In 2009, Channel 4 did a, a drama series called uh, 1066, and uh, similar to 1980s Robin Hood TV drama, both include sort of cartoonish Norman villains with aristocratic accents against plucky English people with working class accents. It's basically class warfare and fancy dress. Some erroneously believe that the working class are more Anglo-Saxon while the upper middle are more Norman. It's completely untrue at the genetic level. All English people and Lowland Scots have Anglo-Saxon ancestry, regardless of class. There is differentiation regionally, but not according to socioeconomic position. Even the alleged racist connotations of the term Anglo-Saxon in America stem ultimately from a desire to use the past to break from the past. Some have tried to connect the term via WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, to the KKK even though that group was based on Scots' identity, hence the use clan. But uh, in recent times, English nationalists have fallen back on Anglo-Saxon heritage as a feature of identity to distinguish themselves from Welsh or Scottish nationalists. Even this, I think, is an attempt to step over our more recent past, that of the British Empire, to retrieve a sanitised national identity from before our colonial expansion. Something for which people can express pride without guilt. White guilt. That's futile. The left will not allow that anyway. We cannot escape who we are and must include Britishness as well as Englishness 
and all the heritage of our imperial period, whether we like it or not. We are compelled by reason and truth to accept that our language and our nation are rooted in the Germanic invasions of the migration era. But we also share deeper roots in this land with the Celtic peoples. And we are known worldwide not for what our ancestors achieved in ancient times, but in recent times. Scruton was right that we should rely on Englishness as a crucial part of British identity, but only as a part of it. The unification of the entire island was already the objective in the Anglo-Saxon period, when kings wished not merely to rule the Anglorum, but to become a Brett Wilder, a sovereign of Britain. Scruton was wrong to think Englishness is contingent on any fragile institution. If any institution ever exemplified Englishness, that is only because it was made by and run by English people. As English institutions run, as English, an English institution run by foreigners, to the detriment of the English, is not English, and we should shed no tears if it falls to pieces. If I invoke Anglo-Saxon ancestors as a central pillar of English identity, it is not because I imagine some egalitarian democratic golden age of the past, nor is it because I wish to justify a Protestant identity in distinction to the Catholic South or ties to our Germanic neighbours to the east at the expense of our Celtic neighbours to the west. Nor is it because, in an era of identity politics and multiculturalism, I seek to sanitise the British identity by reducing it to a pre-colonial form of Englishness, in which the English cease to be global aggressors and instead see themselves as the poor victims of class oppression. I reject the fake Anglo-Saxon identity invoked by low church Protestants, Whigs and class warriors. Yet I also reject the narrative which seeks to minimise the significance that the Anglo-Saxons have for us as English, and therefore also as British people. I invoke them because they are my ancestors. We have them to thank for our language, them to thank for our nation, them to thank for a substantial portion of our blood. We, the English, are an ethnic group, and they are our progenitors. They were not socialists, nor did they know about egalitarianism nor did they see themselves as independent from the Church of Rome in their Christian faith. They were first pagans who worshipped Woden, and then they were Catholics, like all medieval Europeans. If we remember and celebrate them, let it be for who they truly were, not for who we would like them to have been. To quote Sir Roger Scruton, we do not merely study the past, we inherit it. And inheritance brings with it not only the rights of ownership, but the duties of trusteeship, Things fought for and died for should not be idly squandered, for they are the property of others yet to be born. We have inherited the legacy of our empire-building ancestors, of extremist Protestant parliamentarians, as well as royalist rest restorationists, of medieval Catholics and of Anglo-Saxon pagans and Romanized British Celts, of our barrow-building Bronze Age bell beaker ancestors, and of the henge builders who preceded them. All of this we must pass on to future generations. English must, Englishness must now adapt as it has done many times before, from a Catholic to a Protestant identity, and then from a radical low church identity to a more moderate identity, respecting the monarchy again, and the traditions of the high church. But Englishness cannot continue, as Scruton said, by focusing on institutions as the core of identity, but instead must focus on the common heritage and ancestry of our people, recalling with reverence the ancestors who bequeathed us this sacred land. So, in their tongue, I wish you all a good Yale and Yesalia Christus Massa. Thank you. Yeah.